Welcome everyone to the encore performance of understanding the framework for design ex excellence. Um, my name is Rudy Shar. I am co-chair of the uh, Baltimore AIA chapter of Committee on the Environment. And I'm joined with my fellow co-chair Ursula Del Castillo, as well as Lisa Ferretto, Director of Sustainability at Hort Copen Mach, Ben Roosh, Principal FSI Engineers. I know that screwed up that name up, but uh, so let's get going. We are recording this for future use because the past we did not. And um, just so you all know that when you are watching this, you can get the AI credits. You can't get the credits from watching the video, which will be made available. And Nathan can fill us in on that later. Oh, I'm sorry, I also forgot. Nathan is the AIA Associate Baltimore Associate Director and uh, our uh, IT person for this. <laughs> so this is the uh, Framework for Design Excellence Workshop. And we are going to also have GBCI credits. Now, for both of these credits, you need to report. The GBCI credits are self-reporting and for the AIA credits there is a Google form that Nathan will be sending out to people. I believe there's a message in the chat box about that and uh, we can go from there. Uh, Nathan, if I said anything incorrectly just you can just let me know. <laughs> will do, yeah. If you look at the, the Zoom chat box just take a look at that link there and that'll take you to sign in for credits. You don't need to do that to get credits. Okay. So uh, objectives tonight is to basically understand what is the framework of design excellence and how to use it to your advantage. Um, we're going to take an actual case study that Lisa provided to us and use that as an uh, example in real time as we go through the framework and its accompanying super spreadsheet. So uh, as I was saying, we're going to give a little history of the framework, then Lisa will be showing us the case study that we're going to use tonight. And then we're all going to jump in and take a, a section of the super spreadsheet, that's the actual name, and uh, see how that can really help us all do a better job in our uh, design from the very beginning. And then Lisa will follow up with some more examples from her previous uh, code top 10 submissions to see how um, the information can be compiled and presented. So um, climate change caused by human activity is one of the most urgent challenges of the 21st century. Architects have the ability to make an immense difference in mitigating and adopting to its impacts. The built environment accounts for the majority of human caused carbon emissions globally. We must educate ourselves on these consequences of climate change on the built environment so that we can educate our clients and make decisions that protect people and the planet. In September 2019, the AIA formally adopted the AIA Framework for Design Excellence, formerly known as the COAT Top 10 Measures. Uh, the framework will help us organize our thinking, facilitate conversations with our clients and the communities we serve, and set meaningful goals and targeted outcomes. Uh, the framework is a response, is a resource accessible to all architects. It is designed to provide relevant general guidance to architects incorporating deep green principles from the beginning of every project. And the reason we are redoing this presentation is actually this year, AIA Baltimore as well as AIA Maryland are incorporating five of the 10 top measures into this year's design awards and with the intent that eventually all 10 of the measures will be incorporated into it. So the, the five measures you can see at the bottom, design for integration, design for community, design for water, design for energy, design for resources. And when we get to those in our spreadsheet, we'll just remind everyone what they are again. 
So at this point, I'm going to let uh, Ursula take it from here and go over the top 10 measures. Hi, everyone. So um, we are going to talk about the top 10 measures. Um, Code created this to make sure that every architect and designer can approach design from different points of view to make it more sustainable. Um, they have chosen 10 different points of view. Um, which you can see five here, the same for integration, which is all about like, what's, what's the big idea? How can we shape the design uh, around the project's goals and the performance criteria providing utility, beauty, and delight? Um, it talks also about designing for community and wants to describe it specifically how community members can benefit from this project. Um, in all aspects. Can, does, is it creating a more walkable community? Is it human scaled? Is it making members around it more engaged? Um, it also talks about ecology and specifically how uh, sustainable design is protecting and benefiting natural ecosystems and habitats in the presence of uh, this human development. Uh, kind of describing what's the current ecosystem and how is this project affecting it. Um, it also wants to uh, wants you to look at the water. Um, how can we design a building that is conserving and improving, improving the quality of water? Uh, we all know it's a precious resource. How can we make better use of it? Uh, while also respecting the um, the water streams around the building or um, thinking about the stormwater management strategies. Uh, it doesn't, they don't want you to forget the economy about this building, right? If you want something to be sustainable, it has to have uh, an, an appropriate cost and life cycle cost information uh, so that it can influence design choices. If, if it's not economically sustainable, it won't be sustainable. Um, other aspects of sustainability they're looking at is energy. How much energy is the project using? Is any of that energy generated on site? Is it off site? Is it, are we using renewable resources? Um, then it goes into wellness um, because, of course, sustainable design has to support comfort, health, and wellness for people who inhabit it or visit these buildings. We spend around 90% of our of our time in buildings. Right now that we're in quarantine, probably our numbers have gone up a little bit. Um, and there is an enormous amount of people concentrating more on the wellness aspect. So um, we expect this aspect to go up substantially in importance in the future. Um, they also look at resources, how what kind of materials are we going to use? Where are they coming from? What is their uh, product cycle environmental impacts? Um, and how, how is it enhancing or decreasing the building performance? It also uh, goes into the aspect of, of change. Uh, if we want a building to be sustainable, it needs to be resilient. It needs to be adaptable for whatever might happen. Uh, we are, we're seeing this right now. Uh, some hotels are turning into hospitals. If, if a building is able to uh, adapt in time, it will be more sustainable. And it, it will be able to be used in many different ways in the future that we don't anticipate right now. And then it, they also uh, concentrate in designing for discovery. Um, what lessons have we learned over the uh, over time and the performance of this building? How can we share knowledge of what we've learned and how can we educate the community? Um, all those aspects are really important and, and AIA is trying to get us to just pay a little bit more attention to them while designing from the beginning. Um, so we're going to go now into what is the AIA Framework for Design Excellence website. Um, you will see they have they have a, a lot of resources in, in their website. If you can see they're organized per design measure, uh, you will see there are nine, ten, 
the, the 10 measures. So for example, if you decide to go into resources, you will see how it has a lot of information here. It tells you what are the focus of, of this, um, of this measure, what is the focus of this measure, what are the best practices, it goes into safer material selection, so it tells you the best practices for each uh, focus in the measure. Embodied carbon, material sourcing, um, if, if you don't know and you don't have time to read through all of it, it tells you what is the highest impact thing you can do. So if you can only do one it, it tells you a list of this would be the best thing you could do if you can only do one thing. You could choose one chemical such as vinyl to avoid completely in the project's materials. That would, that would be very beneficial. Or, so it tells you three or four and you can choose whichever works best for you and for uh, the particular building you're using. Then it gives you all the resources you could need to make your decisions and find your materials. For example, it, here you will see you have their red list free list and you have um, the declare list and a lot of information about different programs that will give you um, knowledge um, on how to select materials for them to be more sustainable and uh, on how to make do a life cycle assessment there is a lot of resources in here and then uh, they go one step further and they go into projects and then they put the case studies of every single code top 10 winner or a few of them that have followed those measures or those initiatives in their projects right so you can go into any one of them and you can see how they have implemented everything which is is just incredibly useful um so please utilize this website, it's great. Then it also leads into another tool that is incredible that Coach uh, National put together that uh, we're gonna talk about a lot today. It's called the Coach uh, Super Spreadsheet. Uh, it, and it's basically uh, a spreadsheet that has a lot of information and resources and a way to track every single decision that you're making. Uh, you can download it from this website and um, you will see something like this pop up. Let's see. And now I, yes. And I, uh, now Lisa is gonna introduce us the case study that we're gonna use to learn how to fill out this super spreadsheet as a tool and to learn how to track all these different measures um, in the spreadsheet. Great, thanks Ursula. Um, can you go full screen? Yes. Perfect, and then I'll um, take control. Okay, so the case study is a uh, Bennett Middle School, so welcome to school. No one's actually there right now, as many schools in the state. Um, this one is located in Fruitland, Maryland. It was a um, school project that um, achieved LEED goals back under version two. Um, as you know, schools in the state have to have a LEED silver certification. This one was sort of delayed for funding back then, and we went forward with the version two rating instead of upgrading. Um, I'm just going to go, uh, give a quick overview on the site and the school so you have an image before we jump into the super spreadsheet. Um, sorry about my control for a second. This is the overall site, so it's 30 acres. Um, so when architects and designers have such a big site, we have an opportunity to actually look at massing and orientation. Um, so we knew that we wanted that to be part of that big idea. Um, and for those architects that design um, school projects, you know you have a lot of classrooms and then you have some of those big box spaces. Again, this is sort of that big idea, classroom bar in the front, main street connecting it to the big box spaces in the back. Um, there's lots of sustainable site strategies that we implemented. I'm, I'm not going to read all of these. We'll talk about them a little bit uh, when we get to the ecology tab of the spreadsheet. 
um, but I just wanted to show you some visual images. This is the front of the school. Um, you can see the main street sort of popping through. This is the classroom wing. We have a one-story section that has uh, outdoor learning classrooms. Um, on the classroom bar on the south side, we have sunshades. On the north side, we do not. Um, this is the back, sort of the um, middle of the building. This is the main street coming through the classroom wing and then the big box wing, rainwater management, of course, bike paths. At each entry, um, there's different entries throughout the school, after hours, bus entry, car drop off. We have rain gardens at each entry. Um, there's also seating um, for the students when they're waiting to come in. Um, the big idea I already sort of mentioned, this is what the actual floor plan looks like with all the individual classrooms, support spaces in the middle. This is the main street that connects the two bars media center, gym, um, and cafeteria. The second floor is basically just the front uh, bar is two stories. And as I mentioned, this sort of steps down uh, for the two outdoor classrooms. Um, this is what it looks like in section with some of the sustainable strategies pointed out that we'll talk about in more detail in the super spreadsheet. Um, as you enter the school, you as most schools, you enter the secure vestibule to get in through the main street. Um, there's sort of that bridge that connects and you can sort of look down um, the connector piece. We also did, um, because each of the wings, um, it's a middle school, so it was sixth, seventh, eighth grade, and then a special. Each wing was had its own color. And as, the, as they came together through Main Street, um, we did tile to connect the colors together. This is the media center, uh, student dining, uh, art classroom, and one of the um, green roof classrooms. One was more for gathering, and the other one was for more um, science lab exploration and the gym. So I have the pleasure of jumping you right into the spreadsheet. Whoops, Ursula, I think we should take it back. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll um, take control. Or, well, you can just flip through at this point. I just have the two tabs to talk about. Um, so when you first open up the spreadsheet, this is what it looks like in the introduction page. It's basically all that generic project information that you're putting in, square footage, site area, number of students, construction costs. And then it will start to figure out what your benchmarks are. That will be linked through the other pages. Um, and then you can see along the bottom, there's tabs for each of the 10 measures. Um, so we're going to go through each one and we'll um, remind you as we go along which ones Maryland and Baltimore um, are requiring. And then the last tab at the end is sort of summary and a results page. So we'll jump right into integration. The first tab, integration, is one of the ones that our state and city chapters are are requiring. And this one really is a, I think it's a 300 word essay to talk about what that big idea is. Um, so for Bennett, it was the main street, it was the orientation massing. How do we make the best education spaces? How do we connect the students to nature? Um, what I like about this, this graphic is it actually lists all of the 10 measures and it gives designers some idea. How do you start telling the story of your project. And then we can move on to the next tab. Rudy, is that you? So for the uh, design for community, um, really what you're we're trying to get across is that sustainability is tied to the wellness of communities and how community members inside and outside the building <clears throat> can benefit from the project. Um, so ask sort of pose questions like how does this project contribute to create a walkable human scale community inside and outside the property lines? Um, how were community members engaged during the design and development process? You know, how does the project promote social equity? Um, and then the Spreadsheet gives very down to earth sort of scores and you can see there's reasonable ranges listed. It's not in any sort of very, it's a very qualitative uh, assessment. 
So there's not really a lot of math involved, which is great for some of us uh, designers. Um, so it's really showing you the impact of on the community and how you can respond to that and try to do better next time. So that's really what I have for the design for community measure. And then the next one is the design. Rudy, Rudy if, I, if I may, I, like, please note everybody that um, there's four columns here. So you have basically an explanation of everything that the spreadsheet is helping you to do. Um, so here it talks about uh, the walk score and what it generates and then it, it it gives you the resource of how you can calculate it and where you can calculate it plus the reasonable ranges. So basically in everything that it's helping you track, you have the resources, you have the baselines, you have everything you could need. It, this is proven to be very, very useful no matter if you're submitting for a code top 10 or not. Yeah. And uh, first of if I could also point out the, the one, Thing that we really don't think about so much is you know once we pick a site that's it we don't really think about it anymore but when you look at the uh, transportation carbon calculator you can see the daily impact of where you've put your building on the community and on therefore on the environment so that's another good way that for people designers to be um, sort of reminded of how important siting is, not just for the building itself, but for a community that it's located in. So um, I guess we can go now to the, uh, the next tab, the design. And this one is more about um, sustainable design that protects and benefits natural ecosystems and habitat in the presence of human development. So it, you need to describe the large larger or regional ecosystem in which the project is cited. Uh, and then you have to, it poses the question, how, in what way does the design respond to the ecology of place? Um, how does the designer help users become more aware or connected with this place and their regional ecosystems? Um, and then it gets into qualitative uh, questions about, well, do you have more green space at the end and you the beginning, um, which is uh, gives a, uh, a score for that. It gives uh, question, poses questions about using native plants or how much turf grass you're using, which is not really uh, a benefit in terms of uh, most cases other than for like athletic fields, which really Lisa has a great deal of in this project, which is why you see so many, so much of it. Um, but it, the whole intent of this uh, spreadsheet is to get you to start think about these things and see the impact on the uh, ecology. So um, I think at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Ben for water. Yeah, and um, you're going to note the only time an engineer talks here is when we're talking about water, energy, and I'll talk a little bit on the uh, change slide. Uh, and I covered economy in the middle because it just happened to land in the middle. So this is where it gets quantitative. You're, you're putting actual design and usage numbers in. Um, much of this is predicated on your design. And honestly, you should be passing this to your engineer to fill out. That's the easiest way to fill out these tabs. Um, this is all, all in a mechanical set. Um, I put this off of Bennett Middle School long after we remember touching it for any, any other thing that we touched it for. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. Your predicted water use is actually calculated. So the values in blue there uh, come from the other tab and you put a profile that's commercial or domestic or residential. It comes um, from the introduction, right? Uh, yes, it does. It comes from the introduction and then a little further yeah, I, I just don't think we have explained the yellow versus blue. Oh yeah, so yellow is what we fill in. We should do that. Um, yellow is what you get to fill in. Blue is either calculated or comes from a tab you filled out in yellow previously. 
there are only a few places where it doesn't populate until some tab later that had to go back and fill in data. This was clearly intentional that it's a stepwise tabs fill into each other as you go. It's pretty neat. So yellow, you filled all these in and then it auto populates like the average occupancy on water comes from this. Um, and then if you scroll down on water a little bit, you can see the proposed design. And then you can see the base design. We didn't use any water for irrigation. Here's one of the things we learned in using this, this predicted value, the demand and the potable for the predicted is what you would expect from um, a baseline design with baseline fixtures. And your measured is the, you know, what you actually have. Um, and those, the ones in blue that auto calculate don't fill in if you're using an Excel version older than 2017. So if you've got some older version of Excel, it breaks the macros. And it says that on the front sheet, but we, we still had a minor <laughs> freak out there for a bit. Um, where everything was broken, you couldn't figure out why. Anyways, so you get down to the bottom of this and it gives you your, your savings. And the savings values are, are what's really there. So the improvement is um, for the predicted and the measured. On this one. Yeah. And you'll see in the summary and the results tab how those are tabulated and shown. And again, as Ursula said, in the gray columns, it tells you how you're doing relative to other similar facilities. Uh, gives you some big scale metrics to play with. Um, but what this comes down to, if you were doing a lead building, you, you already have more information than you need to fill this in. If you're just doing a standard building and you have an MEP set, you probably already have all the information. Um, let's move on to economy. So this one's pretty straightforward. It's a construction cost benchmark and it benchmarks against other um, other standard measures and, you know, you, you say where you got your benchmark from. If you scroll up a little, it'll show you where you can get some of those benchmarks. I think it's BOMA. Oh, it's over there on the right. Sorry. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So you can come up with some idea of what you should be spending. Um, and these are all hot links. So it takes you out and you can get a pretty good idea of what you should be filling in for benchmarks. Which is great. Yeah. Let's go back to the spreadsheet. Uh, the estimated operating cost reduction. So this came a little bit from maintenance savings and it comes from utility savings. So this is one of the few tabs that you actually have to fill out energy the next tab before this value fills out. So you actually have to fill out a tab in the future before this tab is complete. It's worth knowing. And then the building space efficiency, you know, we didn't do the GSA calculator for this. Um, you can go looking, but it doesn't really fit into every project type. Oh, I should say this one more time. So the integration, the community, the water, the energy, and the resources are what you're reporting on. We're saying that several times. So the integration is really how they all come together. Um, but economy is not one of the tabs you're reporting on. Shall we go to energy? This one's going to look crazy. It's not actually crazy. You've got a predicted that comes straight from your energy model. And if you've got an energy model that just gave you a bottom line value, like what we had for lead, we didn't have it monthly. We just have a total yearly use. You can just divide it into monthly values and you, and the math works the same because it totalizes to a year. Um, and then the measured is what um, Lisa actually was given access to the, this building's energy star portfolio manager that's automatically pulling down monthly billing data. So that's something that we had access to and could average. Um, Lisa actually sent a beautiful spreadsheet. I think maybe an only engineer would say a beautiful spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, doubt to be a, a really easy thing to get out from that from that yearly energy use if your owner is set up to be doing that. That's a that's a that's an if. And then there's a benchmark for the site 
annual energy, and they do make a distinction between site and source energy. So we're talking about the energy at the meter. And then if you scroll on down, you got the predicted and measured, and you can see we're actually operating significantly better than, um, than predicted. So that's an interesting feedback for the engineer. Always better that it goes this way than the other, but um, you know, the measured performance is significantly better than pre predicted. I remember reviewing this energy model for HCM and the engineer saying, I just can't get all of the savings of my really complicated mechanical plant, but I've met the code and I've met the lead points. So here you go. Um, or I met the IGCC requirement. Anyways, so they had captured it and what they said was right. They actually are performing much better than they could model for the building. As you keep scrolling down, Does that again, happen often? That, that is, so it's often that you are, your model was conservative, but your model being conservative five or 10%, you know, this model is conservative by like 40%. So that is a rarity, that's an outlier. But um, models being conservative by a little bit, yeah, that's pretty normal. Um, or being not quite conservative enough. Models assume that the building's occupied all of the hours of all of the schedules of the day, even if you're using a custom schedule school. Um, so what know, happens, and, so it, and what happens if you don't have a model? If you don't have a model, ah, so this is an interesting one. If you don't have a model, you're not gonna be able to fill out much of this tab for the predicted, but you can still fill out the measured as long as it's been occupied for at least a year. So that shouldn't stop you from doing a, a, a design award as long as it's been occupied for a year. If you didn't have a model, you couldn't fill out the predicted, so you can't show, look, we're, we're as good as we said we were gonna be. Or in this case, we're way better than we said we were gonna be. But it works all the same on measured data. You'll still get a comparison against your benchmark score. And if you keep scrolling down, um, yeah, you got lighting and your window to wall ratio, which was a very conservative, exactly 30%. Um, okay, so wellness is our slide. Yeah, that's me. Well, in terms of wellness, uh, we're basically looking at um, a few things. We're like, how, how is the building supporting comfort and health for everybody that is using it? Again, um, I'm going to repeat, we spend more than 90% of our time inside buildings, so we better make um, buildings that are comfortable to live in, as we're finding out now. Um, and so one of the things that they're uh, concentrating on is the quality of views, uh, the fact that people um, want to have operable windows and that have freedom and control over their spaces, um, how much daylighting do they have, so as you can see in the spreadsheet, basically you just do some rough calculations uh, to get the percentages, uh, which will help you in the future and tell them if, they, if you install daylight sensors or not, and if your windows are operable at all. Um, and then it, it gives you reasonable ranges as in every other tab, right? So good is if, if you have more than 75% if windows with good views and if more than 60% are operable, that's, that's good design. But if it's 100%, then that's very high performing uh, for this parameter. Um, it also asks you about the uh, temperature control. Um, everyone wants to be able to control their own temperature in their space. So uh, do you have accessible thermostats? Um, how many occupants do you have per thermostat? Um, do you have test lights for the desks? Um, so basically it's just looking at how, how much control do occupants have over their space, right? Then they go into indoor air quality measurements. This is a hot topic right now. I'm sure there will be many more uh, limitations in the future. But uh, so far, what they ask you about is what are the levels of CO2 and is there VOCs measured um, in the air? So I'm sure we will start 
get into some other parameters in here and future versions of this spreadsheet to cover all the uh, coronavirus concerns that are have been popping up. Um, but yeah, it basically wants you to look at what is the concentration of the contaminants um, in the space. And it, again, it gives you the sources, so you can go to the USUVC lead version four contaminant control table uh, to look at yours. And it also uh, wants you to take a look at um, how are your materials? Do they have uh, health certifications? Uh, have you avoided any chemicals of concern? Uh, so you just you would just basically populate them here. You could do a percentage. I think it's on on the product cost, and then you would put, yeah, so I put a carpet, and the carpet has a clear certification label, um, and that this can help you track uh, what, what changes you've done in materials uh, to, uh, to improve their uh, the indoor air quality, basically, and the level of contaminants. And then in terms of resources, uh, they, they concentrate on several things. One of them is the embodied energy. Uh, this is getting to be more and more important lately, especially since uh, in November the EC3 tool was uh, pushed out. Um, and that's a tool that basically will help you um, understand what is the carbon footprint of every material that you're using. Right now they have they're very limited uh, to some materials like concrete and metal. Basically, they, they have gone for the high volume materials first, and then they're going to keep expanding. It's an open source kind of um, tool. It's a website, and there's a third party lab that is making sure that all the information is inputted correctly. Uh, but basically, all the all all the brands can submit their products uh, with their EPDs and they will uh, be populated in a spreadsheet so that everybody, when they're looking for information on the carbon footprint of a material will understand how high it is and how it compares to others in their category in the industry. Uh, so that's, that's one of the reasons that Embodied Energy has Kind of come to the forefront of sustainable uh, buildings, building design lately. Um, uh, we're going to see how to use the build carbon neutral tool that I have up here. Basically, it, it tells you, it helps you understand what is the embodied carbon of your construction project in particular. So here we have populated basically the square feet uh, the square feet of the building, how many stories does it have above ground, below ground, what's the primary structural system, um, what's the eco region, you can see the map that says it, um, uh, was the site previously developed or not, um, what kind of vegetation are you planting on the site, um, and then you just input how much landscape are you disturbing and how much of that landscape are you going to install back. So once you have inputted all that, you can hit calculate and this very clearly gives you a number. So this is really easy. You really only need information you have at your fingertips. I didn't use any weird number, any mysterious number from anywhere. Um, and you will get a number and that's what you put in here. And then uh, it, it, it helps you compare it to the baseline and it tells you what are the reasonable ranges for the embodied carbon footprint and all that. Um, you can also input if you've had a life cycle analysis done, you can input the information and tell them what software was used um, what was the structural system? The same, it, 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 you can you can fill this out. And what were the major strategies that you use um, to lower the carbon footprint? And then it goes into um, 
how many materials did you specify that had EPDs? Um, so in this case, this is a kind of an older project. Uh, so you didn't, we didn't do this, but it, it's very easy. You just, I have, I have EPDs for carpet, then you, you put it and then you put the EPD and it, it's just very easy to keep track of this. Um, it also tries to get you to um, look into the construction waste diversion. Um, it tells you the ranges. Uh, if you could divert in 90% of the waste, that would be amazing. If not, there are several ranges that you could do. Uh, but any, any one of these would be better than, than normally. As you can see, if you touch something that you're not supposed to touch, you will get a warning because this spreadsheet is very smart. Um, yeah. So you have all the reasonable ranges for things, which is incredibly useful. And you can say, okay, so um, I diverted 75% by making my builder have uh, five different uh, waste streams for recycling of different materials. And then uh, the last thing that it wants you to look at is, um, did you have any percentage of recycled materials or did you have more local materials or any materials that have third party certifications like Declare or um, Red Leafs Free. Um, and you can see in, our, in this case, we looked at, you, you can find a total construction cost from well, I'm sure everybody knows the total construction cost of their building, but the total materials cost is probably something you can ask your builder for. Um, and then you can calculate the percentage of that cost that was the steel or the concrete or whatever material you concentrated on and populated here. So as you can see, this is just a very, a, a very good tool to just keep track of a lot of things that you don't normally think about and it just gives you ideas about more things that you didn't think about to do. Um, I so, think the next one is for ban, right? It is, but before you go on, this is important because this is the last tab that is part of the reporting for the design awards this year. Mm -hmm. So let's say you designed a building before EPDs existed like this one. Yeah. You have recommendations on what do you do with this tab if you're doing a design award? Well, uh, in this case, you don't need to fill the you don't need to fill anything you don't need to fill everything this is a tool that helps you look at some aspects of your building design but you don't need to do everything for example since we didn't have apds in this case then they did try to have a percentage of recycled materials and they tracked that so they had a 21% of the cost of, of materials was recycled materials and another 22% was local materials. So you can concentrate in whatever you want. And right now the Coach Up 10 um, awards, they don't really require you to actually have numbers for everything. They're, they're basically asking you, what's your story? How did you look at sustainability? How can you do a better job? So you can choose how to orient your story in different ways. And in this case, we would go for the, how, hey, t having 21% of the materials as recycled materials is a, is a big, it's a big change from the baseline. Uh, so yeah. you just would, you would concentrate on that. You would concentrate on the, how much waste have I diverse diverted from the waste stream, like 83%, it's, it's a big number. Uh, so you don't need to fill out everything to make a dent. You don't need to, to fill out anything. It's, it's a matter of what can I do to make this project better? Of course, if you wanna be one of the code top 10, you'll probably have to have done more of these than less, but you don't need to do all of them. And I'm sure if we went, it's, uh, case study by case study, we would find they have done some things very well and some things they haven't or they have only tried a little bit. So I uh, don't think because there's a lot of uh, 
places to fill out in this spreadsheet you have to do all. It's just something to help you think about sustainable design in a different way. And, Perfect answer. And speaking to your question about the awards, basically the AIA Baltimore website has a link that gives the actual description of what they want for each one of these five measures. And for designing for resources, they're asking for documentation, the specific material choices and diversion of materials from the waste stream. So they're not really asking for huge uh, analytics. This being the first year that they're trying to incorporate the design measure, the top 10 measures into the design awards. Yeah. And also if you can also use this spreadsheet without an award behind it or without wanting to go to an award. It's a very good tool for sustainable design. So yes, this helps you document and track everything that you could talk about for a sustainable design story to present into an award like in the framework for excellence or the code top 10, but you can just use it for sustainable design without presenting it to an award later. Uh, now, if you have already done this job, it, would, it will be way easier to present it for, to any awards later because you have already done part of the work. But um, it's just a way to make our buildings more sustainable. Shall we move on to change the tab? Yes, yes let's do it. And again, this isn't part of the submission this time. And it is pretty darn straightforward. So percent of reused floor area, the days the building can function without power and how functional is that power? How, what passive strategies did you use? And then the building lifespan. Um, and it depends on your specific uh, structure primarily, um, but also how it's built. And it's really, really straightforward. You talk about a couple strategies that you use for longevity. The polished concrete floors was a big one here. Um, you know, those will essentially be the life of the building. And then discovery is Lisa again. So the discovery tab, this one's mostly about um, what kind of performance have you documented? How have you shared that information in terms of transparency and sort of occupancy feedback? So. This project in particular, um, we were working with an, um, another project with the same owner. So we always continually sort of check in to see how things are going in our past projects. Um, I did get access to their Energy Star portfolio manager while Comico County sets up all of their projects in that. So that was pretty easy to have them add me as a read only member. Um, we did a whole um, daylight. Um, research study. Uh, ben was part of that as well. So uh, we did formal on-site daylight measurements. We did modeling. We did calculations. Uh, we put it together in a publication. We presented it at AIA National a couple years ago. Um, so those were sort of lessons learned um, that we could bring back to um, designers and architects. And let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, Post-occupancy air testing, we didn't we didn't do, well, we might have done air testing. I'm not sure why that's, no. Um, Post-occupancy energy analysis, that's yes, that's sort of collecting that data. Um, and I just, I think it was a good point that Ursula made is that um, everyone on this call as a co-presenter, um, we love Excel and spreadsheets and we think this is a super spreadsheet. Um, but it really is just a tool. And AI Maryland, AI Baltimore is not asking you to sort of fill this out. And Rudy mentioned um, there's a document out there that they will say what they really want for each of the categories. Um, this presentation is just to show you, the, you this as a tool um, that will be useful for our local chapter. AIA National, you will have to report on all of these. And then if you're going to go for an AIA code, um, you'll definitely need sort of all of this information as well. Right on. Should we go look at the summary tab? Um, yes. So this is a fun one. It's all the numbers in one place. However, I think maybe only engineers and Lisa is the only architect I know who just geeks out on the numbers with me. Uh, <laughs> so go ahead and scroll on down. It gives you all of them in one place. Um, 
Oh, and results. then the results tab is where it gets a little nicer looking. Um, so it shows you how you're doing by very high performance to you know none or worse performance. I really like the carbon over time. So it shows you one year occupancy, what you're doing and that energy in your first year is 31%. And then the cubicle and car carbon over, over the building life, it's all energy savings. It's all you know energy use is the primary carbon driver of the whole building. Um, which is a, a really nice graphic graphical way to show it. Uh, go ahead and scroll on down just a little. Hey, so basically every metric you just put in, you can see how you're doing based on your color scale. Um, it's it's really nicely done. It is a super spreadsheet. Yeah, you have the lay in here. Yep. It's line to high performance. And then and the like reference info. That, we, no. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say with the color coding, you know, from the light green to the darker green of what's the highest performing, not every project will have sort of all dark green colors, um, but it's sort of finding what is important to your project and how do you sort of, how can you tell the story for that? And we have a couple of slides for um, doing that in the next section of the presentation. Yep. Uh, and then the reference info tab, we don't really need to go into, but it's got some very good stuff on baselining and I think we should like, go into it. I think it's great. Okay. Um, so we've been using this because it's actually it's easier to go to than it is to go to, you know, like other reference material all just because it's in one place. Um, so your carbon, your energy benchmarks, it's, it's all here. It's really, truly fantastic. Yeah, um, I've, I've found it especially useful for um, basically submitting the, the 2030 stats for the AIA 2030 challenge. You, you can come to the energy benchmarking here and you can have your EUI and LPD baselines per type of project, which is pretty cool and super useful to have this at your fingertips instead of having to call your engineer every five minutes with a different project. <laughs> Can you find me this number? <laughs> yeah. So I think this is great. Well, I would have to agree with both Ben and Ursula. I mean, it really is a great, a great deal of effort went into this by Cope National to create this spreadsheet because it does give you, it doesn't just ask for the information and leave you in the dark to try to figure it out. It gives you links, it gives you data, it gives you hints of what to do. And so you're able to use all of that to fill in all the, the numbers that you can. Yeah, you don't need to be a sustainable design consultant to fill out this Excel sheet. You just need to follow the instructions because all the instructions are here. So from here, we're gonna show you some Elisa's uh, past submissions and how you how you make all this data into a compelling story. Okay. Oh, sorry, one second. Switch yeah. control. Mm -hmm. Great. So as I mentioned, not everyone we realize not everyone like Excel and um, just submitting the, the spreadsheet isn't going to win you anything. It's sort of how do you tell the story? Um, this is a project uh, that was completed a few years ago, Green Street Academy. Um, so we went through all of the 10 measures and put together a visual graphic representation of that. This, um, when we did this, the super spreadsheet didn't exist yet. Um, so this is one of the measures that um, the AIA Maryland and Baltimore are requiring integration. This is the project information, right? So we had a quote from the executive director about what was important to the school. Um, by that point, we had got the LEED Platinum certification. So we had the little marketing blurb about the second largest LEED Platinum project in the, um, in the world. Um, we had all the staff on the numbers of students and faculty staff, construction costs, um, community, we talked about community engagement, the walk score. This is in uh, West Baltimore, right? So 98% of the students use alternative transportation. Uh, we then converted that to sort of carbon emissions saved. We talked about the community connections. 
this school really reached out to a lot of um, partnerships throughout Baltimore and the state. You can see them sort of all listed here. Ecology, um, one of the reasons the construction cost was so low was that there wasn't really much site work. Um, so we worked with the school to develop a master plan for future development. We talked about different types of landscape and learning. Um, right now, we actually just finished publishing, publishing a research project on biophilic learning spaces that was happening in this area right here on the back side of that classroom wing. Uh, for what are we basically took all of those numbers that Ben was showing in the spreadsheet and we had our graphic designer sort of create little tabs to talk about we modeled, modeled at 30%, 74%. But still, even looking at those percentages, what does that really mean to people? Okay, well, that's 276,000 gallons. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, let's talk about bathtubs. People can sort of visualize what that means. Um, and then when you start thinking about the life of the building, and this is something I do a lot in my sustainable signage that I do for clients, is sort of convert it back to something in the community. So over 50 years, that's 13.8 million gallons, enough to fill the Baltimore Aquarium seven times. So we've all been to the National Aquarium. We all know that's a lot. Um, and if that happens every 50 years, that's saving a lot of water over the life of the building. Um, Ben's completely right. I'm not sure why economies measure five and energy is number six. I have always I wanted to flip these pages in my in the presentation um, because a lot of the information that comes from economy is talking about the energy cost savings. So again, we had the model, we had our PV, and then what our actual savings were. Um, so 41% sounds great. Um, when you say it's $100,000 a year to a Baltimore City school, that's real money that they can use on education and some other things. Um, we put in this tab measure uh, what the neighborhood statistics were of that West uh, Baltimore neighborhood. Um, energy, we just came up with some different graphs of comparing models to actual. We listed energy use intensity, carbon emissions, again, converted it to something that people could sort of um, visualize. Carbon is sort of so uh, really hard to visualize for people, I find. Um, wellness, Ursula was mentioning, I think now this measure is so important to talk about the IAQ strategies that were implemented. Um, we did daylight views, lighting, thermal comfort. They um, also have a lot of student health and well-being programs, so we listed all of those partnerships there. Resources, um, we this was an existing building, so embodied carbon sort of way down right here, zero embodied carbon of existing building versus this many metric tons of a new building this size. So that's, that's great. Um, we reused 99.8% of the existing building shell and about 66% of the inside. You can sort of see the photos of what it looked like before and what it sort of looked like after. This is another example of resources where um, we had specified some sort of flooring for this classroom. And as we were cleaning it up, we thought, oh, wow, look at these wood floors that are underneath. Let's just refinish the wood floors and not use that extra material that we were originally planning to use. Change, um, we sort of decided to do sort of a timeline. There was an existing, uh, it used to be an existing high school. It closed in 1985. It sat vacant for 30 years. Um, this is when it, construction started, when it achieved platinum and sort of thinking ahead for future generations, again, what Ursula said, what will this school be in another 50, 100 years? Um, we talked about community resiliency. We could convert the PV panels to day school could function without power, although ask Ben why that's not actually, why that actually couldn't happen, because it's still connected to the grid. Um, discovery, this is that measure that talks about sharing knowledge. So we did a post-occupancy survey. We had a great response from the students. 242 students responded. Um, this was our scale. We, you know, we had little smiley faces. Um, and this was the re response rate. I just have to add this little tidbit of information. Um, if 20% of people are dissatisfied, you're supposed to sort of ask, you know, why? And so when we asked the sort of why, 50% were hot and 50% were cold. Um, so we think we did, we did just fine. 
um, because no one's ever going to be completely happy in, in this scenario. Um, ben probably has a comment on that as well. <laughs> Uh, yeah, ASHRAE 55, the thermal comfort standard says if you do your job perfectly, 10% of people are, 20% of people are unhappy and it splits both ways, which they're, which way they're unhappy. So you're, you're winning here. Um, this one, um, it got a lot of, the school got a lot of publicity. It won lots of design awards. Um, and we also went out and talked about it a lot in presentations and publications. Um, Ursula showed in the beginning, she linked you back to the AIA national website um, that went into the measures. And from there, you can look at everybody's submission for AIA Coat Top 10 and see how um, a lot of them are telling their story. Almost all of them are using these numbers, you know, using little icons, using numbers, having diagrams with little airflow um, <laughs> diagrams and such. Um, so it's just a great resource to sort of see how people are presenting their information. I know AI National, a couple years ago, they even had a webinar about how do you present this information. Um, but just sort of bringing it back, um, this webinar today wasn't about how to win an AI Top 10 Award. It was about sort of the spreadsheet and how to use it as a tool. Um, we just thought showing some of those examples from Coat Top 10 would, would help people sort of tell their story moving forward. Yeah, and so uh, we listed all the links that we've been using as well as a few more for everyone. And uh, I believe, Nathan, we are going to try to send this out to all participants. That's correct. Probably sometime tomorrow. Yeah, so there's a lot of neat stuff. The design, the AA Baltimore Design Award questions are shown here as well for you to, those who are considering entering. Yes, and I guess we can open it up for questions. Does anybody have, Ben, have you been monitoring the I the have, chat? and it's been, it's been silent on questions, um, or at least it's been silent on people asking everyone a question. If you want to type in your question, great. If you want to it's not actually that easy, but you can unmute yourself. Um, it's in that bottom left corner if you want to ask a um, person. Oh, we have a first question. Does the AIA perform a follow-up check on the awarded designs over time to verify continuous satisfactory performance based on the originally submitted coat super spreadsheet? Five years, 10 years, what sort of timeline? I think that might be an AIA Baltimore question. Well, I think we should also first say you don't really submit the super spreadsheet for any awards. The super spreadsheet is a tool you use to track every every piece of information you need for the awards, but you don't submit the spreadsheet itself. Correct? Correct. Yeah, you're submitting narratives about it. I don't I don't know how much of those metrics you're going to need from the results part. Um, and you've got to go to the document Rudy mentioned to know exactly what you're reporting. But I have never heard of the AIA doing uh, checkups every five years on all their awarded uh, projects. I would, I don't think that happens. Yeah. No, I, I agree, Ursula, but the AIA Coat Top 10, I believe they do track. So you can go to their website and see all the past awards winners and see how they've been performing. And just as a note, we just had the uh, 2020 Top 10 awards come out, which was pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. So if you have a chance, check it out. And you can get that link. Oh, thank you. AIA website. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rudy. I meant to mention that earlier. They, they were, it was just announced last week. So definitely check out the 2020, 2020 award winners. Um, yeah, actually, I, um, Gensler, Gensler won like three awards, which was very exciting. So I hope I get to see if the, if we're actually tracking, if they're actually tracking the projects, I'm going to ask around and see. That's because Ursula works for Gensler, in case anyone know, didn't know that. Uh, um, I will also copy the link in the chat box. 
Go ahead. Lisa, you were gonna Great. Say I also, Go yes, ahead. I was. I wanted to know if Ursula or Rudy, um, I can answer Ruth's next question, and maybe we could pull up Rudy that um, file that you mentioned, that PDF of what AI Maryland Baltimore is looking for, because they are looking for some metrics, and I'm not sure the interface of how that information is is collected. Um, but some of them will be a 100 word narrative or a 500 word narrative, energy and water, they are asking for actual metrics. Not as right. detailed as the spreadsheet, um, but they will ask for some. So we can potentially pull that up and, and show you or put the link in the, in the chat. Um, and, um, and then Ruth's question. Ruth's question oh, is, really, is really interesting. I would say yes, Ruth. Um, every graduate student in architecture should be familiar with this super spreadsheet. I think it's an incredible tool for uh, experienced people and inexperienced people alike. Um, they will, it, it's something that they can use as a cheat sheet to design sustainably and it's every year it's going to be more important to do sustainable design for everywhere so if a graduate student comes out of school knowing this knowing how to use it at least it will be incredibly valuable for the rest of their career because every year sustainable design is going to become more important we're we're barely <laughs> a couple of decades away of this becoming a, a really urgent matter um and and my company, for example, in Gensler, we have our, our goal that by 2030, we not only want to be uh, a net zero energy, building net zero energy buildings throughout, but also carbon neutral buildings. Um, I think our goals are be going to become more challenging every year in the past. So if a graduate student has already that knowledge, he will become a more important part of the team. And I would just like to say, as an, as an overview, just over the past few years, there's been an immense increase in resources and information available to architects in this field of sustainability and uh, materials. So um, it's getting better. It's still not where everyone wants it to be, but it's certainly improving. And like Ursula said, uh, you, the younger architects coming in, coming to the profession will be much better equipped to address these issues and when they start working. Yeah, and um, so Jillian is asking about um, the spreadsheet. Is it a tool? Yes, the spreadsheet is just a tool created by the AIA to help us design better. Uh, it does not replace lead or BREAM or any other third party verification. It's just for you to track. Nobody's checking it behind to see if you put the right numbers or not. Uh, now, if you decide to submit um, with all the information that you have tracked in the spreadsheet and you decide to submit it to the Code Top 10 Awards, it's not, it's not a certification, but if you win an award, you've won an award. Uh, so it tells a story about sustainability in a different way, but it's not a third party verification system that says, yes, you are, you're proved to be sustainable. Nobody is checking that you did the numbers right. It's on you. Yeah. Also, we're saying in the yeah. spreadsheet that they worked hard to walk a line between what you can have on hand and report for an average project and um, and also having meaningful metrics to aspire to. And it, you know, it doesn't go as far as some rating systems where you really do have to take many design steps beyond to reach those metrics. Yeah, and uh, the other thing about the spreadsheet is that it's not meant to be, it's like when you go for lead, it's either like you're going for lead or you're not doing any sustainable design. This, the whole idea behind this spreadsheet is that to get everyone from day one to start thinking about what they can and cannot do and how they can do it and do better the next time. But I just want to add in, if your project is going lead, it will make it a lot easier. <laughs> um, 
the, the reason we picked this project as a case study was it went through lead. Um, I had already sort of assembled a lot of the information, the data, I had access to the measured, the actual data. Um, and I know for a couple of the tabs, I just had to pull out those lead templates and send them out to the team and we could pull the information from there. So it doesn't replace lead, but it definitely, if you're already going lead, um, you'll have this information more at your fingertips than if you don't. Um, I think from what I know, AI Code National uh, developed this spreadsheet. I first learned about it in June 2019 in the AI conference. Uh, they let us have a sneak peek at it. They had already been developing that for like a year and something. And they, it, was a, it was a team of, I think, six or 10 AI Code National mm, big names. Um, we had a two hour workshop to go through it two years ago and it was still in uh, beta test. Also the code top 10, the, all the framework uh, was still in kind of beta testing. So we had a sneak peek at it, but they had been working on it for a long time. It, it was a, it's a very professional, uh, yeah, very professional development. Okay, other questions or again, you can unmute yourself and ask one in actual person. Um, give it a minute. So while everyone's uh, typing, I just wanna point out that the deadline for entry for the design awards this year um, is June 30th for AIA Maryland and it's September 8th for AI Baltimore. Okay. Okay, well, I guess if there's no any more questions, we could close this session. Yeah, I think, uh, I want to thank all my uh, co-presenters for doing all this. This was a lot of effort on everyone's part. And it's something that really should be known to and by all the architects here in Maryland. It is a great resource. A great deal of work was put into it. And it will be a great help to architects of all types and all time, types of building types. Um, if you need any inf more information or have any more questions, you can reach out to our committee, uh, Code, Baltimore Code, through the AI Baltimore website. And as well as that, we also have a Facebook page where we also post a lot of information that we find uh, important for people to know about. Also in the next few uh, days or a week or so, we're gonna send out as uh, the committee um, a survey to basically gather information of what what's the status of members uh, right now with the COVID um, situation. We want to see uh, what are your interests uh, regarding the future of the committee, what kind of events are you interested in, uh, how we can get your help on organizing some uh, so that we can have better events. Um, so make sure you, that you look out for that survey to come uh, soon from the AIA and fill it out to give us some more information. Um, yeah, so I think we can, yeah, thanks everybody for, for showing up and learning a little bit more about sustainable design. And uh, we hope you use this a lot in your future work so that we can start seeing more sustainable buildings popping up. And again, your building does not need to be lead to apply some of the tricks that the AI has put together in both the measures and the super spreadsheet. You can use only one or you can use 20. You can choose how sustainable you go um, let's just do this one step at a time. 
Uh, but if you can jump instead of walk, that's better for all of us. <laughs> yeah.